has never been reached. The supreme answer to the problem of life has never been reached. All that we have for these particular conclusions is our own inward realization. So the formula is rather simple. We can build everything on the outside up to a point, but to complete it we must call entirely upon the inside. It is our own inner life that must perfect every structure that is formed in the material world. The answer to everything lies in ourselves. We can read books up to a certain point. We can use laboratory experiments up to a certain point. But somewhere along the line, as the alchemists learned, and they studied from the Alexandrian savants, the al alchemists learned that the final ingredient of the transmutation was man himself, the internal part of his own nature. His own soul had to transform base metals into gold. His, each individual soul must perfect the structure of his life, otherwise it will never be perfected. So to account for this, nearly every monument of importance in the world either has the top part missing or a bad scar in it, something imperfect, something that represents uh, a flaw in the original purpose, because the completion of it must always depend upon the consciousness of the person beholding it. Otherwise, the secret cannot be perfected. Another interesting aspect of the pyramid problem has to do with the pattern of the Egyptian temple system. I think there's a good probability that somewhere there was some form of contact between the pyramid and one of the other temples of Egypt. This may have been, however, inten intentionally closed off at some time. This presents us with a very curious circumstance. The king's chamber in the pyramid, uh, hidden within 200 pi uh, feet of masonry in all directions, was originally ventilated. Two air shafts went from the king's chamber in an upright diagonal motion to the surface of the pyramid. But when the capping stones and the casing stones were put in place, those air chambers, those air passageways were sealed off. In other words, they come to the surface but are now covered or were covered originally by the casing stones. There was no aperture. They were not ventilated, but they were originally intended for ventilation. The answer seems to be, therefore, that something in there had to be alive and had to have air, although there is no clue to what it might have been. Of course, the present openings have nothing to do with the ancient uh, design of the pyramid. Why, uh, for instance, would it be called the tomb of Hermes? What and who was Hermes? Hermes was the Greek and, uh, form of the deity Mercury. And the Egyptian form of Mercury and Hermes was Thoth, the god of the writing tablet. Hermes was a symbol of the universal mind because it was said of him in his own day whenever that was because he is probably also a symbol invented by the Alexandrian esotericists he is not known prior to the rise of Alexandria what was that he was the author of 10,000 books and some of the old stories tell us that he was the author of every book that was ever written in the world. Well, the implication is pretty obvious, namely that he has to represent the power of mind, which is the author of all things. Therefore, Hermes is universal mind. He is the uh, universal mind that may have been symbolically buried in the Great Pyramid, which is supposed to have been his tomb. Not a uh, Ferio, but the universal mind itself, which in turn might point out the idea uh, of a universal symbolism, that the secret of the mind was built into the structure of the pyramid, and therefore the investigation of the pyramid could ultimately lead to the discovery of the nature of mind. In any event, however, Hermes, as the author of all the books in the world, 
uh, became, in a sense at least, the symbol of the great esoteric schools. He became the scribe of the gods, the interpreter of heaven. He attended the psychostasia or the weighing of the soul of the dead in the great Egyptian mortuary papyri and paintings. And uh, Budge and uh, also Breasted of Chicago were perfectly aware that the Book of the Dead was a symbolic document and that the symbolism of the death and resurrection of the soul in that book was based upon the rituals of the mysteries. Here we have a parallel, therefore, that we have to consider. Namely, that in the old papyri, uh, the tomb of the deceased person was nearly always portrayed as a pyramid. It was a pyramid upon a square base. And the uh, opening of the base was in the bottom, not on the pyramid top, it in the square base. Therefore, the implication could be that there was an opening in the pyramid below the level of its foundation. But in any event, this ritual was the story of the soul's journey into the afterlife. And uh, it was a very complicated story in the Egyptian mythology. But it all was condensed into a, a fraction of its original length in a ritual performed by the Egyptian priests. Uh, Breasted told me that he was perfectly aware that it was a ritual when he translated these papyri. And this ritual was the ritual of coming forth by day. Those who die the ordinary death go forth by night, according to the Egyptians, and they wander in a kind of darkness, of uncertainty, they wander through a universe that is benign, wonderful, loving, but like an infant, they have no memory or no conscious thought of where they're going. So those of that type who just simply die as they have lived, asleep as to reality, who have never improved themselves by any conscious effort, these are the little ones. They are not evil. They're not doom per perdition, their mistakes will not prevent them from growing, but they are still unable to come forth by day, which means they cannot come forth consciously. They cannot come forth lighted by their own inner light. So they are the ones who must wait or must go to the Amentet, the Amentet or Elysian fields being the paradise of Egypt. The, uh, the soul of the Egyptian who died uh, went on into the other world and did what he did here. There is the story, of course, of the money lender who died in Egypt in the old days. He was a good man. He was honest in his money lending. He never cheated anybody. He was very sincere, but he had no knowledge of anything but money lending. So when he died, they gave him a table and some small change and told him to keep right on going. So he kept on borrowing and money. As a ghost, he, he lent money to spirits that did not exist except in himself and received interest on them and lived very happily, enjoying the, the life he was familiar with. And this he would continue to do until he was brought back into embodiment. And then gradually, little by little, he would outgrow it. But there was no force in it. There was no evil in it. There was nothing terrible that was going to happen to him. He was going to be very happy because he was a good man. Virtue rewards with happiness in the afterlife. It may not result in illumination because the average person who passes on will not be happy with illumination. He will be happy only with the things that are familiar to him. The way of life he has always known is what will make him happy. But after the initiation rites have been performed, the individual comes forth by day. He realizes his place in the plan. He realizes what is next for him. He realizes that going into this larger life is an opportunity to correct all failings of his own thinking. They will come closer and closer to the eternal truths, which are the source of his ultimate union with deity. So by coming forth by day, he comes consciously into the afterlife. 
fully equipped to face its mysteries, fully equipped to adjust to its circumstances, and already able, at least dimly, to perceive the face of the great God that hides behind the veil. And in Egypt, I think uh, the Egyptians believed that the Great Pyramid was the symbol of the state of consciousness, the state of the internal life of the individual, which in perfect mathematical order and harmony comes forth out of the body in the light and is led by the master of the secret house into the presence of the great gods where he receives this, the uh, Croix Sans Sata, the symbol of everlasting life. Everlasting life is not the fact that we live forever, for we do that whether we know it or not. But everlasting life is to know it, to realize it, to understand it, not to doubt or to fear. We have a life, as the Egyptians said, unto everlastingness. But only those who have retained a certain inward light know for certain that which others hope. And as the Roman, one of the Roman philosophers said, wisdom brings knowledge to those who have hoped and brings perfect understanding to those who have lived in a certain optimism but not certain of that which is to come. But the mysteries may put the whole universe in order. They put the individual in order. They made everything as it was and as it should be. And the pyramid, according to the Egyptians, was a tes testimony set up under the directions of deities and their architects and artisans so that all men might know that forever and ever the great light, the great good, and the flame of aspiration would burn in man. And if as long as it burns in man, it will burn in the world. But if it goes out in man, it goes out forever. So the wisdom of the ancients was to continually introduce and initiate the worthy into the real purpose of the plan, to help them to understand the great dignity of life, the great value and virtue of obedience to law, and that forever the pact between heaven and earth was sealed by the symbolism of the pyramid. This is what uh, the Alexandrians worked out and thought about it, and I think it comes rather close to the facts of the matter. Well, I guess that's all for today.